2 Chronicles 36. We're going to start in verse 14 today. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate all our visitors. We want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel right at home. If anybody gives you the crook eye, the hook eye, the evil eye, or anything like that, you come tell me who they were and I'll pop them, all right? No, I think everybody here will treat you right. Second Chronicles 36, we're preaching about Hezekiah. There's a, there's a revival. What am I doing? Second Chronicles 36. Second Chronicles 36. Yeah, that's what I got. Am I in the wrong spot? I'm going to preach this no matter what. This is not about Hezekiah. I did this last Sunday morning. I started preaching something else. It's not about Hezekiah, but I'm going to preach it anyway. I got home last night and I was tired. Um, where is that chapter? Second Chronicles, it's chapter 30, isn't it? Second Chronicles 30 is about... Hezekiah, yeah, there we go. Why did I put that there? That's got to be the wrong, that's got to be the wrong sermon. No, there it is. Okay, I'm good. Never mind. Everybody calm down. I found it. Because I, I was dead tired and I got in last night. And I had worked on this a uh, few days ago. Second Chronicles chapter 30 verse 8. Whew. Thank you God. All right. Hezekiah. God has opened up his heart. First day he's king. First month. First year. He's going to open up the doors of the house of the Lord. He, he brought, had all the Levites go in and clean out the house of the Lord. There was filthiness in the house of the Lord. We didn't, the Bible didn't really describe what that was, but there, all that is there in the house of the Lord. His daddy, Hezekiah's daddy is the one who was responsible for all that mess being in there. And Hezekiah's daddy closed the doors to the house of the Lord. So Hezekiah now, it's in his heart. And that's the difference right there. If it's in your heart to do something, you'll do it. If you're just running it around in your mind, you probably won't. But if it's in your heart to do something, you do it. How many of you love this country? Raise your hand. It's, if it's in your heart, you can put your hands down. If it's in your heart, and all of a sudden we get attacked in this nation by some country somewhere. China hates us, whatever. Would you defend your country? I didn't say join the army. Army wouldn't take most of y'all. But according to what I read, we're the militia. We are the people who will defend our country. If it's in your heart to do it, would you do it? I would. I wouldn't want to, but I have children and grandchildren that I want to grow up in a country where they can still read the Bible. And all you got to do is watch Pastor Jason Cooley, his video that he put out last night, the guys that hate the gospel so bad that they would have killed him if they knew they could get away with it. In fact, some of the people that went to the CHOP zone, CHAZ, to preach there got beat up mercilessly. And could have been killed. Okay? So if, it, if it's in your heart, you'll do it. So that's where Hezekiah is. He's cleaning out the house of the Lord, trying to bring revival into the land. And so I'm going to pick up, kind of back up a little bit, where we left off last Sunday. He wrote letters to all the people in the outlying communities, telling them, come to the house of the Lord. And we're going to have the Passover the way, Moses, way God told Moses to do it. 
we're going to have the Passover in the second month. They couldn't do it in the first month because they were all defiled. So God had mercy on them and he's letting them, giving them, remember last Sunday, second chance. God's given you a second chance to accept the Passover, which is at the cross. Amen. So the letter that he sent out starts in verse 8. Be, now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And remember, this is the sanctuary right here. Your body is the temple of God. This is the house of the Lord. He will, and when God sanctifies you, you are sanctified how long? Forever, amen. That's why he said that. So he said, verse 9, For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the post passed from city to city. In other words, they carried this letter out one city at a time, read it out loud in the town square, posted it up where everybody could read it. And then they went to the next city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. These are all tribes of Israel. But they, watch this. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Now I'm going to preach on that. They laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse meaning various, diverse people of Asher and Manasseh, nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Remember, there's two groups. Those that hate God, hate the Bible, hate preachers, and hate you for believing it. And some of them are in your family. Are they not? Some of them are people you know. People you work with. They hate the Bible. They hate God. They hate preachers. Like that guy accusing Pastor Cooley of being an adulterer and a rapist. And he said, you don't know me. But that man growing up in a church where the pastor raped his mother. That's his view of all preachers. They're just in it to take everybody's money and steal their, steal their daughters and steal their women. But nevertheless, there's always some who will humble themselves and they'll come to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes, by the word of the Lord. Let me ask you this. Should we keep looking for people in Turkana to feed? Are we all of one heart? Should we try to find people in our own town to feed? We're all of one heart. Should we take what God has blessed us with and stockpile it up in the bank and just do nothing with it? Or should we use it to bless people's lives? All one heart. And that's what God was doing. When God's in it, God blesses it and God pays for it. You never hear me ask for money. So they had one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. Let's pray so my mind can, so I can preach this message right. Father, I love you. Lord, I was so grieved. So grieved Sister Mailer died. Never met her a day in my life. But I just loved that woman. And Father, I, I'm not angry at you. 
because I know she's in a place now. I know, thank you, God, those pastors go out, talk to her, pray with her. Father, she's not going to hunger no more. She's not going to have to ask you to feed her anymore. She's in, a, she's in that place. And Father, my heart is burdened to help people, to help more people. So, Father, would you do that? Would you let us do that? And we don't have to do it on a big scale. We just, God, just send us people one at a time if you want to. However you want to do it, God, that's how we'll do it. But, God, put it in our heart to help. Put it in our heart, God, to invite people. Ask them to come to the house of the Lord. Put that in our heart too and we'll do it. And Father, I pray God you would help me to preach the message. The devil's already trying to kick me around and work on me a little bit and I don't like that. So God, have mercy on me and help me preach. Use this, Father, for your kingdom and your glory, not mine. I pray, dear God, that if somebody's listening, somebody's watching, whoever hears this, God, that they would not mock you. What they say about me is of little consequence. It, it just really doesn't matter to me. What they say about you, God, that bothers me. That car with that bumper stickers Lord out in our parking lot that bothered me that made me angry this morning and God whoever owns that car they need to be saved they need to know the real Jesus not the fake one that they've heard about but the real one so father help us dear God to not mock you in anything that we think say or do help me to preach this message God because I certainly don't know how to do it for your glory's sake and we pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen so back up to um, verse 10 so the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh even unto Zebulun but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody, witness to somebody about Jesus? You ever tried to talk to somebody and they laughed at you and they, they scorned you? I had a situation years ago, uh, me and a, a deacon, when I was pastoring down in Richwoods, there was a, a young lady that had got saved during vacation Bible school and she asked to be baptized. So it was brought to my attention. I said, well, let's go out Thursday night. And let's go talk to him and, and talk to her about baptism. So we knocked on the door and asked to come in. And th the mom was there. And, and uh, I asked her, I said, can we talk to your daughter? You, you know, you can sit here with us. Just want to do it in the living room. Can we talk to your daughter? But she asked to be baptized. And I'd like to explain to her what baptism is all about. Her mom said, sure, sure, that's fine. But I could tell she was acting a little nervous. And I knew that somebody had walked out of that kitchen living room area. It was a little trailer. Somebody had walked out of that when we walked in. When they heard what we was there for, they walked out. So I talked to the young lady about baptism, what it meant. And, it, you know, you're not, you're not saved by baptism. You're already saved. And it just explained Romans 6 to her and things like that. And, Talked to her about that, and, and I didn't know her mom, so I said, now, mama, you know, your, your girl here, she's asked Jesus into your heart, and, you know, you've heard me talk about all this, talk to your daughter, but, you know, I'd like to ask you, I'm not trying to push you, but do you know Jesus? And she said, hang on a second. So she got up and went back in the back room and got her husband out, and he came out. We were in the living room. He came out to the kitchen, we, and we were standing up, and he stood there like this. What do you want? 
And I said, well, we, we was talking to your daughter about, she, she gave her life to Jesus during our vacation Bible school. We were talking about baptism. And then, you know, I asked your wife, you know, if, if maybe she was saved. And I said, I'd like to ask you if, you know, Jesus came and died for our sins. And I quoted Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, 1 John 1, 9, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I mean, I quoted all of them. And he stood there. You know what this is? When you're talking to somebody, they're making a fist with their body. You ought to see what I'm seeing right now. Husbands going. Wives going. Mm -hmm. And he stood there like this the whole time. And when I finally got done and I asked him, I said, would you like to know that you can go to heaven when you die? And just as cold as ice, he said, I know about you. I know where your church is. And if I ever feel like coming to your church, I'll come to your church. But other than that, I don't want you in my house anymore. Cold as ice. And we said, okay, sorry to bother you. And we walked out, and I did, I went. What was I doing? Shaking the dust off your feet. And I said to Kevin, the deacon, I said, that man will be in church all right one day. Or a church service. It'll be his funeral. And he's going to go stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what I'm talking about. Don't mock God. That's, there's always going to be those people. Now, 2 Chronicles 36. Verse 14. That's what had me scared. I'm going, did I get the wrong message? 2 Chronicles 36, verse 14. This happened. And... Leave your Bibles there open, 2 Chronicles 30, if you want to. Put a little bookmark in there. Moreover, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Do you see that? Hezekiah's generation. Well, let me back up. Before Hezekiah, they polluted the house of God. Hezekiah's days, they cleaned up the house of God. After Hezekiah's dead, <laughs> dirty it up again. How many of you know somebody like that? They go out and get all filthy in the world and come to church for a while. Pray, oh God, have mercy on me. And then stick around for a while and then boom, right back out in and again. How many of y'all know somebody like that? In verse 15, and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising be times. That word be times means early. Try to... Try to reach people early in life. Like when they're children. That way maybe it has a chance for them to... It sticks in their life if you teach them about Jesus when they're yearly. Amen. Sent to them, rising up be times and sending because he had compassion. Look at this. God has compassion on his people. And he has compassion on his dwelling place. Who is his dwelling place? It's us. God has compassion on you. That's why he forgives you. And that's why he will forgive you again. Amen. He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. You know what that means? At some point, even God gives up on you. When God looks at your life after having worked and worked and worked and worked in your life, when God finally says, 
there is no remedy for them. The word in the Bible is reprobate. You know what that means? They revoked their probation. Probation is about somebody did something wrong. Well, let's give them a second chance. Maybe, maybe they learned their lesson. But how many people on probation actually learn their lesson? Nowadays, not many. And so finally, the court says they are reprobate. They violate them, send them to prison. Verse 17, therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden or old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. Here's what that's saying. The people that God's going to turn loose on you don't care who you are. Don't care if you're young or old. Don't care nothing. They will cut you down. Why? There's no remedy for you. Sometimes you can whip a child and whip a child and whip a child and whip a child. And they still grow up reprobate. There's no remedy for them. Turn to Lamentations chapter 1. All I'm going to do today is give you verses out of the Bible. Is that all right? God will say it a lot better than I can say it. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 7. Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. They called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. And that's why that book is Lamentations. God is weeping. Jeremiah is weeping as he's writing this out because God is sick and tired of his people sinning against him. Lamentations chapter 1 verse 7. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old when her people fell into the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversaries saw her and, listen, and did mock at her Sabbath. You know what Sabbath is, don't you? That's God's day. Today is God's day. Who can remember a time... When they wouldn't sell you no beer or alcohol on Sunday. Who can remember a time when the gas stations were closed on Sunday? When the stores were closed on Sunday. And they were closed on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter. They were closed on those days. Why? They weren't saved, but they had respect for the day of the Lord. And now... Some of you folks ha didn't know what happened here earlier, but now, several months ago, we had a problem with people pulling in the church parking lot doing meth deals because one of our neighbors was selling meth out of their house and they were using our church parking lot. And by the way, when they didn't have money for the meth, then they broke in our shed and stole all our stuff out of it. They said, it's a church. Who cares? They probably didn't say those words. They probably said something else. But they said it's a church. Who cares? They didn't have respect for the house of the Lord. They mocked her Sabbath. Verse 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. Therefore she is removed. All that, honored her, all that honored her despise her. Because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. You know what the comforter is? The Holy Ghost. You know what the comforter is? The Bible. Somebody say amen to that. The Bible's your comfort. Amen? How would you like for you to get to such a state? God takes away the comforter out of your life. He takes away the Bible out of your life. And you just don't read it no more. Oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. The adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things. For she has seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into this, thy congregation. Oh, you know what that means? We got churches full of wicked people. Who shout and they wave their hands 
and they had they sing and they come and drink their coffee and everything's good. They're all good people, but they're full of wickedness. They're in the house of God. In verse 11, all, all her people sigh that they seek bread and they have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. That's what happens when you mock God and you may never, you may never say, I hate God. Blankety, blankety, blank to God. Blankety, blank that Bible. Blankety, blank that preacher and all those churches. You may never say that. You could sit in a church pew and mock God with your life. Am I right? You could live your life in such a way outside of this church that everything that you do when the church people ain't around testifies that Satan himself is in your life and in your actions. But then come to church on Sunday and act like nothing's wrong. That also is mocking God. And there's a verse. I don't have it in my notes. I don't know why I didn't put it in there, but it just came to my mind. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I don't know why I didn't put that in my notes. But God can be mocked by the things that you do after Sunday morning service is over. And will God be mocked for very long? No. Matthew chapter 20, turn there. Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall deliver him to death. And they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. And you know what the disciples did? That went boom right over their head. They didn't think nothing of it until after he's crucified. And they're going, didn't he tell us that? And then they didn't believe it. And they had to wait till after the resurrection. And then they said, he told us this. That he would do this. But I want you to look at your Bible again. Going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of God. Jerusalem on earth is supposed to be a picture of the Jerusalem above that's in heaven. The city of God is supposed to be a picture of that. This church is supposed to be a Jerusalem. It's supposed to be a representation of the city of God in heaven. Your life is a Jerusalem. You are supposed to be a representation of Jesus Christ and his kingdom in heaven here on this earth. Everywhere you go, every place you are, every hour of the day, you are supposed to be Jerusalem. But what did they do? He was delivered unto the chief priests and to the scribes. You know who that is? That's the religious people. Joining church doesn't make you right with God. Doing a ritual, if we were to have communion right now and hand to everybody what, what we had here, the communion, if we handed that to everybody, you could partake of it. That doesn't make you right with God. In fact... If you do that, the Bible says you are mocking God. 
Because you live like a devil outside of here, but come into here and act all holy and spiritual. Do people really do that, or am I making that up? People really do that. Matthew 27. Look at what they did. Happened exactly the way Jesus said. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, he was the king. And he said, he needs a crown. So they took thorns and wove them together and made a crown. And when they put it on his head, they didn't just very gently set it on it. They took the reed and tapped it down on there. And they gave him a reed in his hand like a scepter. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And does that also happen in churches all over the world? People can bow their knee and say, Hail to Jesus, the King of the Jews. And they're just mocking God. They hate him. They hate him. Acts chapter 2 verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another. What meaneth this? Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. Here was the day that the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the apostles and the disciples. And 120 people standing out there speaking in human languages. God had given them a gift. So watch this. God, Wayne, had given them a gift so that the people could have the word of God in their language. And they mocked that, Brother George. They mocked it. I sat in two Bible colleges while they mocked this Bible. They mocked the King James Bible. They said it's not translated right. It has mistakes in it. We don't use it. You need to learn Greek and Hebrew so you can correct the Bible. They mocked this book. I'm glad my wife... Do you know why I didn't graduate? God hardened my wife's heart. He did. I'm not blaming her. I'm not blaming her. She was right. But God was trying to pull me away from that mess. And I was trying to go back in it. And God hardened my wife's heart. And I never finished. Thank you, sweetie pie. I mean it. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Again, two types of people. Mock the preacher. Or those who say, we want to hear some more about this. Two types of people. Which type do you think is going to heaven? So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. And among them was Dion Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Hebrews 11. Very quickly. Hebrews 11 verse 36. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. He's, this is Hebrews 11 is the faith hall of fame. This is where all the people. Moses, Noah, uh, Enoch, um, Abraham, Sarah, Shunammite woman. All of these people in the Old Testament... That their names are mentioned now because they had faith. And he, he mentioned Gideon. He mentioned that some of the judges. He mentioned all the people in the Old Testament. And then, then he, when he quit giving names, he just said, and others. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Listen to me. They will mock you. They will mock you. They will hate you. You try to give somebody a gospel track. You try to give somebody a DVD of one of the sermons. You try to give somebody a CD of preaching. You try to witness to somebody. They will hate you. And by the way, I think it, there's coming a day when they're going to get us. 
They were stoned and they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about and see, I'm not, I, don't sound, I don't think I'm really selling Christianity very well here. If you get saved, I promise you, you will get sawn in half. That's not a good sales technique. But let me tell you, whatever they do to you down here, God's going to come and do to them double while you're up in glory. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain and with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should, be, should not be made perfect. If you live for God, they're going to mock you. Amen? Now back to Second Chronicles. Did you hold your place there? I told you to. I'm going to read you this. And then I'll be done. Very quickly. There's something here I want to share with you. And then I'm going to let you go. Second Chronicles 30 verse 13. And they were assembled at Jerusalem. Much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread. In the second month. A very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. And all the altars for incense. Took, they took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. We're talking about this stuff for the pagan gods. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. Remember, that's a picture of Jesus dying on the cross for us. And God giving you a second chance. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers. For everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. Remember, we learned last week that the Levite priests were not ready even for the second Passover. Some of them were still unclean. Now I'm going to show you something that will just blow you away. It did me. Verse 18. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. Listen now. They were supposed to prepare themselves before they ate the Passover. They were supposed to sanctify themselves, cleanse themselves. They were supposed to wash. I'm sure there was a period where they were to be set aside and sanctified and touch no unclean thing. And then on the Passover day, then they could partake of the Passover. But watch this. Let me ask you a question. The Passover is Jesus. When you partook of Jesus... When you ask Jesus to come and live in you, were you clean? I wasn't. John wasn't. My mom and my sister weren't. Who else was filthy and dirty when they came to Jesus? You weren't supposed to be able to partake of Jesus' salvation. Because it said, though he being, um, yet they did eat the Passover, otherwise then it was what? Written. You violated the word of God. So according to God's commandments, you should have been killed. But look. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one. Does the governor of Missouri have the right to pardon somebody? Even if they're guilty? Can he commute somebody's sentence? Does the president have that power? Do you know where our founding fathers got the idea for that? Right here in your Bible. If God can pardon people, earthly rulers can do it too. The good Lord pardon everyone. And I want you to notice 
He goes from verse 18 to verse 19 in the middle of a sentence and there's not even a comma, a colon, a semicolon, a period. It's just odd to me that the Bible cut that verse in half, stuck the rest of it in the next verse. The, look, the good Lord pardon everyone, but not everyone. He will pardon those that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not, be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Somebody say amen. God went against his own rules. And he said, I'll forgive you. I'll pardon you. I'll cleanse you. Do you know why? Because you came to me and asked me to forgive you. That's why I'll do that. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat through the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God their fathers. Keep going, verse 23, and I'll be done. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep others seven days. Look at this. They were having so much Holy Spirit joy in them, they said, is there anything in the law that says we can't keep going? No, let's keep going then. And they kept other seven days with gladness. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks, seven thousand sheep. The princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks, ten thousand sheep. And a great number of priests sanctified themselves. And all the congregation of Judah, and with the priests and the Levites, and all the congregation that came out of Israel, and the strangers that came out of the land of Israel that dwelt in Judah, rejoiced. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites arose and blessed the people. And their voice was heard and the prayer came up to his holy dwelling place even unto heaven. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard old saints? Old saints that have been around a long time, way back in the old days. Ever hear them say, well back in the old days, we used to have revivals that lasted one, two, three weeks long. Ever hear that? You ever hear where they said, why, back in those days, preachers used to preach for three or four hours. You ever hear that? So don't be mad at me because it's past 12. I've never seen anything like that, but I've heard about it. But here's what I know, Cubby. The days, a, the days ahead of us are going to be better than the days that are behind us. We can't go back now and bring, we can't go back to Mayberry and live like they did in Mayberry. We can't do that. But I believe that the days that are coming, Brian, are going to be better. I believe the days of your life and Sister Pam's life and Sherry and Phil and Mom and me and all you people, I believe the days coming are going to be better than all of the old days that were behind us. If I didn't believe that, I probably wouldn't be able to preach much because we don't have anything to look forward to. They said not since the days of Solomon had they ever had anything like that. Well, they're having it now. And wouldn't that be great if all of a sudden the Holy Ghost came into God's people and all of a sudden churches started having revival. I mean, not just announcing, we're having revival service next week. I'm talking about really having revival. Wouldn't that be something? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads.